Thomas is going to talk about his book, Do Travel Writers Go to Hell? Expect to be very interesting talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to uh, be here at Google today. I'd like to first off thank uh, David Bennett for making this possible, and other David for the uh, nice tour around. It's a uh, fascinating place where you all work. Um, yesterday's inauguration is kind of a hard act to follow on, but uh, bear with me. Um, so my name is uh, Thomas, Thomas Kong Sam. I'm uh, originally from Seattle. I've just moved back here in the last couple of years. Um, and uh, I wrote, well, I put my visitor sticker over here, most <laughs> of the cover, but uh, Do Travel Writers Go to Hell, uh, which came out in April of this year, is a book about my experience and my sort of conversion from office life nine to five universe to becoming a travel writer and what I experienced along the way. Um, so in the past I worked for Lonely Planet, Rough Guides, Travel and Leisure, Forbes Traveler, a number of different newspapers, websites. I have pretty uh, broad experience in the travel writing industry, also working as an editor. Uh, and in, in many ways from the time that I was a little kid, even though I didn't realize it at the time, I was somewhat destined to go into travel writing. I, I fought against it, but I grew up traveling, and I'll get back to that why it's sort of, it's, it's hard to make the decision to become a writer and sort of throw it all to the wind and give up stability and everything else, but um, I traveled a lot with my family from the time that I was a little kid. Uh, my parents were big travelers, traveled around the world, 1968, 1969. Um, we never had a fancy car or a nice TV or anything like that, but my parents were both school teachers, had the summers off, and we would go and travel from London to Cairo to Tangier to uh, Budapest overland, or, you know, there's some boats in there, obviously, too. Um, and uh, so I got, a, I got a, a strong attachment to the road and to travel at, at a young age. I traveled first by myself at the age of 17, I uh, went to, to Spain, so, um, but this was always balanced against the fact that I was, I was a very dedicated student, and um, so I was, I, in college I was majoring in political science, I thought that I was going to go into law school after finishing undergrad, I had, you know, started to gear up for that, I had a summer internship, um, and it seemed like, okay, I'm going to I'm a lawyer now and move on with my life, and this whole travel thing is, uh, you know, been a dalliance of, of youth or whatever. And uh, I saw a advertisement on campus for a job working as a guide with volunteer programs in Costa Rica. I was like, oh, I think, you know, I'd really love to do that. And I started thinking more about it. You know, why shouldn't I? This is my life, right? So I. I ended up passing up on uh, the legal internship that I had lined up, and this was sort of a significant crossroads, and going and working as a guide in Costa Rica. <coughs> and then one thing led to the next. I ended up you know, working again as a guide in Costa Rica after I graduated from school, going on working in, um, in Ecuador also. And during that period of time, I got a lot of experience uh, working in the tourism industry, the, even though I wasn't directly in the tourism industry, I was, again, working with, with volunteer programs, but I got to see, and, and this is Costa Rica in, in the late 90s, which everybody is probably familiar with now as a very popular destination. It was sort of more up and coming then, and I watched as a number of these small, sleepy beach towns got inflated by tourism, by you know, hordes of, of travelers coming from North America, Europe, what have you, and sort of the, the, the very confused and confusing effect that it has on a place, whereas on some levels it's good, it's good for the economy, it brings in business, but it comes along with all sorts of problems too, forced a lot of the locals out of the town, brought in prostitutions, brought, prostitution brought in drugs, um, a number, a number of, of negative issues. So I started to get a sense of of how, you know, how this fit into the bigger picture of international development and, and the pluses and, and minuses of tourism on the developing world. 
became a major interest of mine. I went on to do a master's in Latin American studies at Stanford, which was a pretty idealistic thing. I, um, I remember the, uh, the first weekend of school, I was there with, um, you know, meeting some of the other students, and uh, I met a computer science student. He said, what department are you in? I said, Latin American studies. He said, Dutch guy. I said, oh, very bad idea. You'll never make any money. But, I was like, mm, yeah, well, you're probably right. But at that point, I was still, you know, I'm going to do something and save, save the world. Was, that was carrying me through. Um, so I ended up writing my, my thesis. I'm going to move on beyond the biography here in a moment. But this all, this all plays into the memoir here. Um, I wrote my thesis on sustainable development and ecotourism in Latin America, particularly in, in the Amazon. So um, I had started at that point to really form some, some opinions and write about you know, what, what is happening with this process. Um, so after, after dabbling in a PhD and working for an NGO that failed, um, I started to lose a little bit of that idealism and then lose a lot of that idealism as I dropped out of the PhD program. 9-11 happened, I found myself broke, and suddenly real life got in the way the dreams went out the window and I found myself working at a law firm on Wall Street, which was about the last place that I thought I would find myself, but you know, people do what they have to do. And um, so while I was there, and I was talking about this uh, with David and David at lunch, um, we were sort of cleaning up the, uh, the aftermath of the dot-com and, and tech bubbles and got to see a lot of uh, a very different world from what I had been uh, learning about <coughs> school and whatnot. And um, I, that's when I first started to write. And how my book started was I was writing vignettes about office life, not cool, fascinating office life like you seem to have here in Google, but uh, more of a, you know, no, no colorful bean bags or anything like that in, uh, in Wall Street law offices. But and, and some of that stuff never made it into the book, but some of it actually did develop into the the first chapters of of this book. So let me uh, let me read a little first section for you. I have I ran out of post-it notes, so I made some homemade post-it notes here, tore up a three by five card and taped them in. Let me see if they hold their place. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to life on Wall Street. With such a character-defining foothold in the career world, I no longer have to make excuses for the life I lead. No longer do I have to explain my directionless post-collegiate life to incredulous eyes and repetitive <coughs> questions, like, what are you doing next year? Don't you want to do something with your life? And my favorite, when are you going to get a real job? I'm no longer Thomas, the supposed slacker, backpacker, bum, or permanent student. I am Thomas, the employee of blank, 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 and blank, LLP, name not to be mentioned, and I am going places. I make more money than I reasonably, reasonably should, putting papers into chronological order, proning in office speak. Uh, my skill set also includes entering numbers into Excel spreadsheets and working the copier and fax machine. Between those projects, I search for old high school friend's name on Google, play online Jeopardy against my office trivia nemesis, Jerry, and generally while away the hours of my life. Jerry thinks that he is better at Jeopardy than me, but he's really just faster with the mouse. Yes, I know, I have it pretty good. There are people starving in Africa. And there are plenty of people here in New York who would love to change to <clears throat> the chance to be in a cubicle all day and not have to operate deep fat fryers, dive, drive garbage trucks, or do whatever it is they do. The problem is that I am the ungrateful byproduct of a prosperous society, the awful of opportunity. I'm just another liberal arts graduate who bought the idea that life and career would be a fulfilling intellectual journey. Unfortunately, I am performing a glorified version of punching the time clock, and the financial rewards don't come anywhere near filling the emotional void of such diminished expectations. So one of the things, I'm, I'm going to continue on here, but one of the things that I, I was starting to examine in the book was sort of middle class expectations, you go on, you get this kind of job after your school, you do, and, and coming to terms with the fact that, that it didn't work for me, that I had different passions, that I wanted to try something different. Um, and then I start to contemplate, you know, rebelling, throwing it all to the wind. 
I say, but let's face it, rebellion is passe. My parents' generation already proved that over time, rebellion boils down to little more than sob ownership and an annual contribution, contribution to public radio. The old icons have been co-opted. Jose Marti is a brand of mojito mix. Che Guevara is a t-shirt, I know a four plus hour movie. Um, Cherokees are SUVs and Apaches are helicopter gunships. Uh, skip ahead. I continually revisit the words of some sociologist who I read in college. I think that it was Weber or Durkheim. Either is usually a fair guess. He believed that the modern mind is determined to expand its repertoire of experiences and bent, is bent on avoiding any specialization that threatens to interrupt the search for alternatives and novelty. Many people would call that approach to life a crisis, immaturity, or being out of touch with reality. <clears throat> it could also be called the new American dream. Screw the simple pursuit of financial stability. Here's to finding fulfillment in novelty, excitement, adventure, and autonomy. So what's happening in the early part of the book is I'm, um, I'm basically wrestling with work life and then I get the opportunity to go to Brazil to write a guidebook for, or a section of the Lonely Planet Brazil guidebook. And I'm very idealistic at this point. Um, the offer comes pretty much out of the blue and I'm wrestling with Oh my gosh, I kicked and scratched so, you know, and fought so hard to get an, a, my toehold here in Manhattan to get, you know, enough finances to pay my rent in my apartment. I have a girlfriend now, I have direct deposit. Um, and then my sort of idealistic dream comes back in the picture. And there have, um, there have been a lot of books written about people, you know, throwing it all away and repairing the home in the Tuscan countryside, or living with Mexican peasants and finding the um, you know, true fulfillment in life. But this book much more charts my experience that was um, once I became a, a writer and uh, <clears throat> with, with a very idealistic notion that it didn't quite work out the same way. So um, let me uh, just read a quick thing about this is sort of where I'm at as I'm setting off to become a writer. Quick water here. In order, and I knew, I already knew at this point that the, the financial offer, it was, it was pretty tight. This was, uh, I was, I was gonna have to uh, really um, do it on, on a skin flint's budget. And in order to prepare myself for this new half-cocked career choice, I began to read a selection of contemporary travel literature. It was something I felt that I was supposed to do, research material to properly build inspiration. I must have read or skimmed about two dozen different books, and I have to admit that most didn't do anything for me. The majority of travel books fall into three basic groups. One, this is as I just mentioned before, there are the earnest writers who become enlightened through contact with the simple honest lives of Mexican peasants or the unparalleled tranquility of the Italian countryside. A more holistic approach to life is discovered and the universe is balanced. In order to properly enjoy such writing, one should be dressed in echo print polar fleece, drinking fair trade coffee and relaxing to a Putumayo world music CD. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the smug writers who mock how backward plumbing and transportation are outside, anywhere outside of North America. It's always, these foreigners are so wacky and their toilets are too, isn't this hilarious? With a veneer of foreign exoticism and fourth grade bathroom humor, um, petty prejudices are given a new lease on their comedic lives. Such writers should take, uh, give Orlando or Long Island a try for their next vacation as both have abundant new cars and functional flush toilets with soft two-ply paper. Last but not least are the Charlie Bronson guys who attempt solo ascents of mountains without telling anyone where they're going and are forced to amputate their appendages with a sport or a Swiss army knife then expect us to appreciate their triumph of human spirit. They're so overcome by emotion that they must write a book and get a book deal about it. Uh, Paul Theroux once uh, remarked that travel writing is really about the person who's traveling. So maybe it's just contemporary travel writers whom I can't relate to. There are other things out there, better things, classics. There's Chatwin. There are others, Hemingway and Kerouac. Both can be considered travel writers. I could only hope to be like Chatwin, Hemingway, or Kerouac, excluding the AIDS, self-inflicted gunshot wound, and drinking yourself death apart, to death parts. 
They were true writers coming to terms with the struggle of the people, the living history, the challenges of their generation, all while reflecting on the universal human condition with nothing but a journal, a drink, and a pen in hand. Alas, my situation, my situation doesn't come close to Chatwin's, Hemingway's, or Kerouac's. I will be a first-time guidebook writer, and at best a secondary character in a Carl Hyacin or Elmo Leonard novel. That's not to say that I am not serious about this project. I am dead serious about it. It's my big break with Lonely Planet, my opportunity to do something huge, to influence other travelers. I will wring the life out of this project with my bare hands. I will learn about hotels, restaurants, and bus schedules, but will somehow do it in a way that will help us all to understand humanity and our common needs and desires a bit better. I was maybe getting a little ahead of myself there. Um, it could even improve international relations and help the developing world. That's the plan, anyways. So um, that's a little maybe tongue in cheek, but uh, you know. And then when when I did much of the book charts my path actually on the ground as a travel writer, coming to terms with the fact that I had uh, less than three hundred dollars in my account uh, by the time that I really got going, and <clears throat> about a thousand miles of coastline to cover. And what I what I learned in this project and numerous projects after that is frequently how the travel writing industry works is the contract is they lowball writers on the contract and it's the same thing that happens in a number of industries you know I don't know fashion industry um, other types of media that are considered sexy you have a huge potential labor pool and there's no sort of or organization or people are all in different countries whatever you get a, a pretty low offer and if you can't do the job at that price then there's somebody else that will and there's basically the gap between expectation and actual funding is frequently well some writers have trust funds wealthy spouses what have you um, but that gap is usually filled by a very eager tourism industry, which is happy to, and I didn't realize this until I sort of went through this whole project in a very earnest, going through the front door sort of way, spending you know hundreds of dollars eating in all the restaurants that I was trying to review, and then suddenly, <coughs> suddenly, you know, the guy laughs in my face. He's like, "What are you doing, paying for all this stuff?" And, you know, I'm, I'm out of money. I'm trying to trade my uh, my camera for a, for a night in the hotel. So oh, you stay here for free. Eat here for free. You're a travel writer. I thought, you know, I thought you guys knew better. What is this? Your first project or something? <laughs> and uh, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I thought we were supposed to be completely uh, completely objective and do this anonymously. And um, so there's sort of there's a gray area in there in the most um, most publishers allow writers to accept freebies and comps if it's not an exchange, for, an indirect exchange for positive editorial coverage, which means that if somebody offers you a free night in the hotel, okay, maybe I'll get a better understanding of the place if I stay there, but you can't say if you offer me a free night in the hotel, I'll write something positive about you. Uh, Although, depending on the scruples of the writer, that does happen, and there are others out there that twist arms, and um, and it depends on the type of publication too. A, a glossy magazine. Uh, if you work for a glossy magazine, you have you know the tourism board of big countries often beating down your door and offering to fly you business class out there and put you up. So. Um, there's there's some range in that for guide guidebooks are. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Did you meet or spend any time with other Lonely Planet writers before you set out? Um, not on my first trip. It was pretty much out of the blue. Um, so there's no there's no there's no training. There's no. I mean, th there are these PDF manuals that I was also uh, it was about two weeks between getting the offer and throwing my whole life away in New York and getting on the road. So I was sort of reading on the plane and reading in hostel rooms about what was going on. I have since met, um, you know, dozens if not scores of uh, writers that write for Footprint, Lonely Planet, uh, Rough Guides. Um, so yeah, I, I, it, as it was told to me, uh, or as the editor said to me at the time, it's an extremely steep learning curve, as, you know, with any new job, 
but uh, you're working under a, a very short deadline, sort of improvising the whole time. In, and in my case, in northeastern Brazil, where there are big sections with no paved roads, um, no internet, frequently no telephone, uh, heavily accented northeastern uh, Brazilian Portuguese. So, um, but but what I started to look at then, the more that and 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 for the record, I. Although I had been doing other writing, I didn't undertake that trip with any plan to write about it at that point. That is something that, that happened over time as I worked as a travel writer. And I started to see the connection um, between what was going on in the travel writing industry and some of these issues that I had studied before with development and how people. And it, it also uh, involves the way that travelers use these guidebooks. So travelers frequently are using a guidebook as if it's gospel or a, a, you know the traveler's Bible, the pa paint by the numbers approach. And when you go to a, a restaurant and you think you're in some remote place for the you know the best uh, you know noodle dish in this part of Thailand and you go out to the, the place in, in the hills there and you, you're at the restaurant and you look around and there are four other people with the same guidebook there. You start to see how it's um, <laughs> it creates this tourist trail where certain establishments or certain towns get overloaded and flooded with a lot of a lot of travelers, a lot of the development, and other places get almost nothing. Now, what happens when um, when the travelers are supported by, or the travel writers are supported by the uh, travel industry like that, or I should say, subsidized is is, is, is probably more an appropriate word. It's the more savvy businesses, frequently the businesses with foreign owners. So when you know when you're in northeastern Brazil, the uh, the hotel that's owned by you know the guy from Paris and the restaurant that's owned by the lady from Amsterdam, they they have a bit more business savvy um, or West, Western business savvy. They have friends at home that can build them a great website that you can you know they lobby the, they find out frequently ahead of time who the writer is that's coming through. So they're more, they, they have pretty much an unfair advantage over, um, over local establishments. And what happens is, is, and then when you put, also if you put a new writer on the book, they're gonna look through the last book and they're gonna see, okay, this place was highly recommended. They're gonna end up back in the same place. So it's, it's, it, we call it a tourist trail, and it becomes rutted over time, and it's reinforced and rutted. And um, it, it has, not necessarily much of an impact in you know tourism in North America or Western Europe, Japan, what have you. But in areas like where I worked, it can have a major skewing effect on um, on development. So this is true in North America too. When people are travel writing here, that they get lots of hotels. And oh yeah. Things. Well, I mean, and and it, it depends. Like um, something like. Golf magazines or or skiing magazines that almost works completely on on copy because magazines don't have the budget to send you to you know St Andrews or to to Chamonix. I mean maybe their top couple writers that are writing big multi-page features, but um, otherwise most of it's subsidized. Um, and again, it, it depends on the publisher, uh, but but generally that's the way it works. You have to cover in um, you know for that. Brazil guidebook, for example, I had hundreds of establishments to cover. You can't, you know, you can't pay to eat in hundreds of restaurants on on a on a budget that works out to be approximately <coughs> minimum wage, um, you know. And I'd say everybody goes and and I felt this on pretty much every project that I did. I went in with the absolute best of intention and started off, you know, I'd find dig deeper, find that idealism again, and you know, we're all. We're all suckers for travel too. That's how we end up in, in that career. Um, but and then going through a period of disillusionment and freaking out, and how am I going to do this? How am I going to work it out? And then sort of into a hardened pragmatism later on, where you know, okay, I'm just going to pull this together and hit my deadline as best I can, and try to submit uh, good writing under the word count. So again, um, I uh, I wanted to write a book showing about trading uh, you know career and office life for for following your passions and look at that phenomenon too that it's not necessarily that everything works out well my experience was that life is all about trade-offs and that um, 
you know, money <coughs> corrupts, power corrupts, whether on Wall Street or in the seemingly innocuous world of travel writing. And um, those things affect other, other people too. So uh, here's just a, a little um, something from uh, some of the characters that I met, kind of unlike uh, the people that I was imagining that I was gonna meet. I was covering five-star hotels, but staying in the uh, total flea bag hostel down the road, which uh, I had plenty of experience in staying in places like this, and have met versions of these characters that I'm about to read to you. Uh, over and over again in different places. I'm not going to attempt a uh, Norwegian or Australian accent uh, for your benefit. Uh, a Norwegian named Newt. Uh, okay, these are a couple of. Uh, you know, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get my work done. These are a couple of uh, drug tourists, basically, that I'm, I'm sharing a, uh, a dorm room with. A Norwegian named Newt handed me a beer and asked me where I was from, followed by where I traveled to and where I was going the traveler's standards. He was young with an elven Scandinavian quality and was brimming with excitement to be in Rio. This city is my kind of place, he said. Back in school, back in high school, I was an exchange student in Los Angeles for a year. It was great, the sun, the girls, the fucking drugs. Rio's like an affordable LA without all the big highways and shitty American laws. It's definitely not Oslo. In LA, Newt had tasted the world beyond Scandinavian homogeneity and had dated a Salvadorania girl and discovered the joys of crystal methamphetamine. He spoke lustily about meth, like an aficionado of uh, fine cigars or hot cuisine. We'd go to the cook's apartment in West Hollywood in the mornings before school and buy the crystals while they were still warm. Do you fucking believe that, man? They conjured images of white gloved Keebler elves, Keebler elves, excuse me, pulling trays of meth from the hearth. <laughs> I mentioned to him that in the States, people don't usually brag about their love of meth. Uh, you keep it to yourself, like an old DWI or an old case of genital warts. But he was unfazed. Newt had been traveling for the past two weeks with an Aussie he had met in Bolivia. I didn't know his real name, but uh, they referred to him as Mr. Ye, out of his respect for his all-consuming obsession. While other Aussies in the villa, that's the name of the hostel we were staying in, were salubrious looking young fellows who apparently spent as much time in the waves as on land. This one's sunken eyes and pallid complexion spoke of sleepless nights, a pitiable diet, and chronic masturbation. Have you ever tr have you tried the coke here yet, Mr. A Ye asked me? It's fucking brilliant. You can select by strength, good stuff, more mild stuff, you name it. It's all over the place. Shit, you can even get it from the evening guy who works at the front desk. That's service, mate. <laughs> I see why he and Nate are fr uh, he, he and Newt are friends. If you think that Americans and Europeans are cocaine crazy, try the Australians. Finding cocaine in Australia must be like spotting a wallaby on the loose in Fresno. So um, I have in, in the book a number of just different uh, sort of drug tourists, pimps, prostitutes, wild expats who may or may not have been fleeing justice in the United States. Um, and different uh, savory and unsavory characters that uh, met along the way. Um, so, you know, I went on and wrote another dozen guidebooks after that. Um, as I said, I wrote for magazines and whatnot. I have some writing that I was very proud of, uh, did some amazing traveling. Um, ended up also holding my nose through some of it. So as, um, as I started to slow down as a travel writer, and, and I, I lived for a couple years just perpetually on the road, didn't have a place to return to, had things at my parents' house and a few things in storage. And as I, as I came back, um, moved back to Seattle and, started to, and decided to start uh, really working on this book, and I used um, some of my earlier experience. I, again, I started writing about my work experience at the beginning, um, and I came back around and wanted to combine it with my experience in the travel writing industry um, and, uh, and how I fit into all that too. I, there was a fair amount of uh, controversy before my book came out. I don't know if any of you uh, heard about that. It was kind of a lipstick on the pig uh, media moment where, where things got really blown out of proportion before the book even came out and then sort of deflated once the actual book came out and people saw that, you know, 
didn't necessarily say that or do that in there. But, um, you know, uh, I, I guess uh, I could read a little bit from the introduction of uh, this is what I would say my overall purpose what the book is. And um, this book is not intended to be an expose, and it is not intended to discourage the purchase or use of travel guidebooks. I almost always take a guidebook with me when I travel, and I find it invariably helps me in some way um, that makes it worth its price and worth its weight in my pack. As a matter of fact, I almost always use Lonely Planet and find it to be one of the best brands. Um, it is my hope that this book will help to demystify the origins of travel writing and show that when thousands of travelers follow a guidebook word for word, recommendation for recommendation, it not only harms contemporary international travel, but can also do serious harm to places in developing countries. Maybe if people see what arbitrary BS goes into, uh, frequently goes into the making of a guidebook, they will realize that it's just a loose tool to give basic information and is not the singular or necessarily the correct way to approach a destination. <clears throat> voice is um, so travel writing, like any job, has its issues. However, travel writing is particularly disorienting since you are expected to work in a tourist environment that is built for pleasure. You must find a way to make yourself effective in that peculiar limbo between work and play. I imagine that the difference between traveling and professional travel writing is like the difference between having sex and working in pornography. While both are still probably fun, being a professional brings many levels of complication to your original interest and will eventually uh, consume your personal life. We travel writers live in perpetual motion. Relationships are transitory and fleeting. Friendships even more so. Home is where you are on a given night. It is at once glamorous and pathetic, uh, exciting and perversely routine. The longer you do it, the harder it is to return to normal life. And one day you wake up and realize that the road is your permanent address. There's no going back. This is the life that I have led, and this book recounts the beginning of that story. So, um, yeah. Um, Are you still on that road? <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's funny. I've um, the book. It, it's an interesting uh, paradox, almost, in in, in that, that once you start. I, I was writing about my experience as a child writer, but once you get hot and heavy on writing a three hundred page book, you're lucky if you're you know getting out of the house once a week. Um, I, I, I work in bed actually now. I have a lap desk, and uh, I, my my day to day is about as unadventurous as uh, you know. All of your commutes to work is a lot more insane than my average day these days. So I, I, I lie in bed with my laptop, uh, laptop, and my dog next to me, and pet him with my left hand, and think, and then use that hand to type sometimes too. Um, but uh, yeah, so so I finished the book a while back, and I've been. I've been working on a screenplay now, which was something that I went into. I, I, I think uh, it made me my, I have a, I'm realizing, I didn't used to think this, but a fairly strong sense of uh, naivete, um, which helps me to dive headfirst into projects before I realize how horribly huge they are. Um, so I thought I was going to be able to knock out this screenplay in, in a relatively short period of time, but it, it was a, uh, it has been a pretty massive um, very rewarding, but massive undertaking. So I've been, I've had my wings clipped for, you know, since the beginning of the summer too. Um, and uh, now I'm featured, uh, I'm focusing more on, on longer, longer projects and doing my own writing, trying to focus on storytelling more than sort of the reporting of uh, normal travel writing. So, so does anybody have any questions? Um, anybody have any questions about Technology and travel writing. Um, I think it's like a technology. Um, you know, I, I haven't in the past. I found I actually found it a hassle when I first started to have to travel with my laptop, just because. Well, I always did work in the developing world, most frequently in some rougher places. So having the computer was just always something that I had to think about. Uh, when I do personal travel, traveling, I like to dress down and sort of, you know, if somebody steals my stuff, not not the end of the world. Um, but I think, I mean, I, I definitely think that's where it's going is um, so handheld. I mean, 
obviously it doesn't make sense to carry a huge brick of paper around with you uh, that you know and also if you're gonna go to visit Buenos Aires and spend five days in Patagonia <coughs> after that do you need a book that's this thick covering all of Argentina um, so to have something smaller that you can you know access much more specific information is good and I think um, one thing that I was doing, I, I did uh, the research, uh, I, I worked on the Long Point Chile book, and so I did all the southern part of Chile and actually some of southern Argentina for that book, Tierra del Fuego, and I noticed that some advances, advances in publishing, you had more locally produced uh, sort of small magazines than you would find in some of the hostels. So, I mean, as a writer, it's honestly, you're covering all of... Patagonia for the guidebook. I'm in one town for one day, the next town for the next day, and you know, you're trying to get the information as best you can. But you have locals there that are now either have their own sites or, or expats that are living there that have their own sites or sort of small pamphlet magazines that they're distributing in the hotels. This is what's going on in nightlife, you know, so on and so forth. Now, the everything has its upside, everything has its downside, obviously. The disadvantage there is you don't know sort of how corrupted that information, that travel information is. My argument would be that all, you know, all information is, is biased on some level, and it's, it, no matter what you're doing in life, it's never good to rely on a single source of information. Um, but, you know, um, I, I, I do see a phenomenon of much more locally produced material, sort of the old, more almost colonial days of, uh, you know, a Brit, Australian, North American, or, you know, be Kiwi here and there, going and visiting the, you know, the South American folk and coming back and telling the rest of the world what it's like. Now you have more South Americans or Africans or you know Southeast Asians telling you about um, their their own perspective on on their own land. I I, uh, I met somebody randomly on on Facebook, I believe originally, who has the same birthday as me in in a, a smaller city in the Philippines. And she and I have kept in touch, and I've been reading her blog about you know what's going on in her town in the Philippines. And obviously, in the past, that information was incredibly hard to access, and it was just some you know some dude from the Bay Area who was spending five weeks telling you this is what this is what the Philippines is all about. So uh, I, I think the, the user driven content. So I think there's a company now which is doing kind of like a Wikipedia type thing for travel books. Well, there is a Wiki Travel actually. Right. With this in. Um, yeah, there there are a number of things I noticed. Um, I'm sort of flipping through through iPhone applications too. There's um, yeah, there's there's Wiki stuff, and there's also very spe specific content. There are, there are ones that there's one called Barfly, which is just all bars and nightlife, and they have writers that just do specifically that for different towns. And there are very specific restaurant ones. Um, so you know, I guess the issue then is. How do you pull it all together so you don't spend all your time on the road searching, searching through stuff? It, it's one thing to prepare ahead of time and take notes and take that info with you, but on a longer haul trip, you're always going to need to access new information on the go. I think the wiki travel site lets you select the sections here, so you go to here, go to here, go to here, and so I know that Lonely, Lonely Planet, among the uh, guidebook publishers, Lonely Planet's been sort of ahead of the curve on the uh, tech front, and they do what's called a pick and mix, so you can go and order from them. You're gonna travel to Europe for three weeks and you're gonna be in, you know, southern France, northern Spain and you know, Ibiza. You can you can pick those chapters and they'll send you a book with the different chapters together. Uh, I know that in the in the late nineties, you know, um, they started to produce a lot of things with C D ROM and was suddenly gonna be traveling with their call pilot and uh, didn't happen for some reason, but, <laughs> but uh, you know maybe they, maybe things were just a little ahead of themselves. And uh, obviously, as as um, we get you know, e-paper or what have you, we'll see we'll see we'll see what happens. Um, and sort of affordability, um, and you know it depends where you're traveling to. I, if you're traveling in, in in big cities where where you have good wireless access, you know, um, that's already happening. Things are things are changing rapidly, as as you all know. Do you think the shortcuts in the G two, like as a writer, are 
typical? Or do you think you were off one or the other at the spectrum? Um, you know, if you, um, it, what I actually talk about in my book, and one of the things that I make point of is that I, I never once as a writer have ever taken anything in exchange, direct exchange for, you know, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. Yeah, when I was short on money, people, if somebody wants to offer me a, uh, a room or whatever and, and it saves me money so that I can actually go do research somewhere else, I think it's pretty typical. Some people disagree with me. There, there was a big rift among travel writers. Some people said I was, you know, bad mouthing all travel writers, and that you know that that I was an anomaly, that I'm a bad person, and so on and so forth. Other people said, hey, you know, he's speaking the truth that you all know, and, and you aren't just willing, you know, you aren't aren't willing to stand up to it. So, I would I would argue uh, the the latter over the former, but. Um, you know, some some people some people disagree with me. That I, the book is is fundamentally my experience, and uh, you know, I can't necessarily speak for others, but I've I've seen I've seen it happen out there. Yeah. Do you have any good tips on getting out of the tourism rut and, and still having sort of good experiences if you don't have a lot of time to spend in a place? Um, you know, I I think that. The most important thing is, well, you, guidebooks, guidebooks are useful for, you know, to, for basic information. You can do a lot of, I think it's best to do research ahead of time. Yeah, and, and research is, doesn't have to all be travel information. Read history about a place, read literature about a place, get a, get a bigger sense, and then it, and, and I think talk to people on the ground when you're there, because, uh, and, and obviously there are language barriers in certain situations, but in a place where you can communicate, nothing beats, and that's all that you're doing as a travel writer anyways. I mean, a huge part of, part of my job is being like a professional extrovert and a networker and just talking to everybody that comes through and getting ideas and whatever. But I think it's, it's, it's best to just talk to people and be open-minded and, and try not to say, you know, this is what life is like back home, I want to re... I mean, it, it, it depends on your purpose for the trip too. If you want to... And there's, you know, you'll hear some sort of purists or, or gung-ho travel writers in this whole argument, what's a tourist versus a traveler? There's absolutely nothing wrong with going someplace to relax. We all, you know, relaxing is an important, important thing. Um, but, it, it, so it depends on the purpose of your trip, but if you want to go and get to know other cultures or places or learn about the history of the place, yeah, it's good to, good to see the travel information out there so you're not completely reinventing the wheel. But build upon that. Don't just don't just follow it. And and there, yeah, nothing really beats talking to people that live there. And um, you know, just just trying to, to find experience things in, in your own way. So did you speak Spanish? Or did you speak Spanish? I speak Spanish and Portuguese. Yeah. Um, so I, I started. I started, and that's one of the things that really helped me to get the job in the first place. I I went. I talk about this in the book. When I was first out of undergrad, before. And it has happened before I, I um, went back to graduate school. I actually wrote a Spanish language phrase book for Lonely Planet, so I already had a connection to them at that point. And uh, I, I majored in Spanish in college and studied Portuguese after that. I speak Portuguese at home now. So, uh, language, I, you know, I can't uh, say enough about how, how many doors speaking other languages have opened for me, but, you know, it's a huge. work I mean they're all fun in some ways I would, most I don't really have the budget to travel for fun right now um, and I'll travel tax deductible for you yeah that's true but then I, but then I, yeah but this is being video recorded right so, <laughs> it's all for important work purposes um, but uh, you know it, it's hard uh, I'm, I'm always pretty much rolling things together I do like to to travel for relaxation. Now, to be honest with you, over the uh, over the holidays, uh, took a little time off and just stayed in Seattle and did nothing. Stayed around the house, walked the dog, and 
got some writing done. That was a that was a great. I, I guess that's sort of a uh, a national phenomenon since uh, since the economy is split a little bit. As everybody, and I've seen a number of travel articles, and they're trying to invent all sort of sorts of catchy names that I won't repeat because they're just silly. But for the stay at home vacation, uh, but yeah. Um, I, one of the one of the great things about living back in Seattle, one of the things that drew me back to Seattle is just how easy it is to get out of the city. I, I have a <coughs> pass up at Alpental, so um, when it's not raining up there, as it has been in the past few weeks, I, I I really enjoy the balance being here, being able to work part of the day and get out of the town, get out of town, and, and do something different if possible. Um, but I think I'll probably always travel. What do you think about traveling like a backpacker, staying in hotels, taking local buses, versus going with a tour company, which has scheduled for you, which is pick up your airport, pick up, give you a bus, and all that? What do you think? Like, I just want to compare these two. Okay, well, I, I mean, I think it really depends on you and what is. And as I was saying before, I don't think that, you know, there are purists that are backpackers that think, and I've read reviews of my book that. You know, people, he didn't even camp, you know, stay in tents while he was out there, and he stayed in hostels every night, and that's not hardcore enough. And then, you know, it's not, it's not all about, and, and that's what I was kind of joking about the people that, you know, I don't go with any guidebook, and I do it barefoot, and I do it with no money, and just, you know, you know, just a, a pack of matches and a Swiss Army knife or whatever. I, it, it depends on you and what you what you want out of out of your trip. There's nothing wrong. With going on a uh, with going on a tour, I, I would highly recommend before anybody commits significant money to being with a tour group that you see that they you know can you know try to get more information on them. They conduct themselves in a responsible way, preferably a way that they're not a company that's exploiting a place or take you know taking all the money and then funneling it back to an office in Orlando or something um, it's a, a company that contributes to the well-being of the places that they that they see uh, or that, or where they take people um, but if you know traveling independently is it's a lot of hard work and when you're in the mood for it and it you know maybe you get a more raw uh, deeper experience in certain ways, but you have to have the energy for it. So if you've already worked 50 weeks out of the year and you want to go and see some place and not uh, have a stress meltdown because you can't figure out the bus schedule or whatever, there's you know there's nothing wrong with the tour. And for certain parts of the world, that's really the only way to you know if you want to go to Antarctica or some countries that are more difficult to access, like Libya. Um, Frequently, the tour is really your best option, if not your only option. Do you have any favorite cold travel tricks? Tricks? Thanks for summing up. Swiss Army knife is harder and harder to uh, take up planes and stuff. Um, <laughs> I, well, I, I like to, I like to hide cash around in different places. Um, so I'll have cash in my wallet, but I always take a few 20s and like hide them in with my socks. And then somewhere else, so just sort of uh, spread my risk around in case I, in case anything happens. Um, another thing that I always used to do uh, when, especially when I started working as a guide in Costa Rica, if, there, if you're in a place where you're gonna be traveling around and flying in and out of a major city, uh, when, I, when I arrived there, I put my passport and my return ticket in a lockbox at a hotel. Um, and I had a photocopy of my passport that I carried with me. So if anything happened, my bag got lost, somebody, you know, I got robbed, whatever, all I would have to do is figure a way, and, and some money also in the lockbox, so all I would have to do is figure, you know, traveler's checks at the time to be, to be more precise. Uh, I just have to figure a way back to town. So I think it's always good to, now that I'm trying to talk about, you know, what hardcore situations I'm in or whatever, but. You know, a little mishap can really spoil a trip uh, because you don't have if you don't have much of a safety net. So, um, and and again, I just I really make uh, an effort to to talk to people as much as possible when I think 
that whether you're on a, a tour or on a six month overland backpack trip, um, they're always going to learn more about the place that you're in by speaking with people who Yeah, I mean, I I, I understand that, that it it, it it's depends on on your disposition, but um, yeah, I mean, you meet people around there. There are other introverted, you know, there are introverted people in every, uh, or or more quiet people in every culture too, and you don't have to be. Uh, getting into huge and deep conversations with people, but just, you know, just make an effort to make yourself available to, and a lot of it has to do with the, the way that you're presenting yourself, and depending on where you go, some places you go to, everyone's extremely introverted, like the difference between being in a small town in Peru and a small town in Brazil, or universes apart, a small town in Brazil, you walk down, down the street and, you know, maybe all the school kids know your name by day two, everybody's very outgoing, in a small town in, in, in Peru, maybe, you know, in some, some small towns in Peru, I'm, I'm very, I'm generalizing very much here, but um, I've had experiences where everybody looks at you like you've just come off of a, you know, a UFO or something, so it depends on the place too, but, but I think that really just making making yourself available and, and not, if you if you strike a very defensive, and, and sometimes it's necessary to strike a defensive posture, uh, <laughs> but uh, don't, you know, don't be, don't be too too tense. Well, I, I spent some time working uh, down in the Caribbean, and I was in uh, St. George's in, in Grenada, and I had the good fortune of a, a good friend of mine, an old roommate of mine's uncle, uh, still lives down there, with uncle, and I saw the cruise ships coming in day in, day out, and I'd see how the culture, everybody would change, and all the people come up, you know, and it's everybody's opportunity to, you know, that's their job, it was their opportunity to get a taxi fare or to, to sell something, whatever, and all the people on the, ship get off and there's this instant sort of icy uh, tension that comes in and everybody get, gets very, I mean, again, I'm generalizing, but people got very defensive, like everybody here is to rip me off and whatever. And, and when it really came down to it, I, I thought people, people were really great down there and really open and outgoing. And I think if, if you take softer, um, more open approach with people, they will, they will frequently take the same with you. And I might just, Take advantage of you, <coughs> rob you. Then, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not recommending you, but uh, that's where you go. So. Have you been robbed? Um, only once in uh, in Venezuela, and um, yeah, I, I I was a little overconfident, I think, and that that I never had any trouble, and uh, I was just out by myself late at night. I was doing some research. Of, Sports. I was doing bar research, I guess, for my guidebooks. <laughs> uh, that's what I convinced myself, anyway. But I was within, you know, I could see the the sign of my hotel. Um, but I was probably a little. I'd been warned not to be out in the neighborhood by myself, and I was probably a little too cocky. I had just been on the road for a couple of years at that point, and uh, it just put a pride issue. Oh yeah, I came out here no problem. And actually, I got hit with the, the butt of a gun here above my ear, which was not. Uh, not a pretty, pretty sight. So, I stole my shoes. So I didn't have any money on me. I thought, okay, you know, whatever. I don't have much money, so nobody's gonna rob me. So I stole my shoes, my belt, my chapstick. Try to take my pants off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's very hard for it. Just here, here's a travel tip. If somebody's trying to steal your pants, hold your feet very far apart, and it's, uh, it's really hard to take the jeans off. The police, fortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, came in the middle of that. Two cops on a on a motorcycle, with machine gun, and put all the guys up against the wall, made them strip their clothes, and started hitting them with a stick. I was like, no, you really don't need to do that. Uh, yeah, so good times. But uh, otherwise, you know, that's that's one one situation that I shouldn't have put myself in out of uh, years on the road. And I think if you're, you know, if you're cagey, uh, obviously anything can happen. You can get robbed. Square if you're maybe not that likely, but <laughs> it's possible. Um, anyway, uh, you know, that's just one one small negative mark on a out of out of a much wider career that nothing bad ever happens. What?
So where are those places you've been? Where would be the place you would uh, you know, be the client ever go back? The place you hate the most. <laughs> I'm still inclined to ever go back. Huh. You know, I've liked every place in some way. There are a few cities in the U.S. that I have no interest in returning to. Uh, Orlando comes to mind. Personally. Yeah, yeah I, haven't, I haven't been to Orlando, but I haven't heard a lot of uh, positive reviews. Uh, you know, I've. I, some of some of Borderlands Mexico, I, I think, is is re it's really unfortunate and paints a negative picture of Mexico to people. I think Mexico is an amazing, beautiful country, and um, you know places like Tijuana and whatnot. People see that, and think, you know, it, it especially for Americans, it, it sort of uh, backs up a lot of their worst stereotypes. And I think that there's much more to a country like that. A, a lot of a lot of Borderlands are are the same especially when you have a wealthy country on one side and a, a poorer country on the other side from sort of a contraband zone. Um, but, you know, my, my attitude is that they're, you know, they're fasc I, I've been fascinated by all the sort of the, uh, what's going on around the fringes, too. So, um, you know, I, I spent some time in this town on the Brazilian, Guyanese, Venezuelan border, and it's all Venezuelan troops serving gas to big lines, it, gas is really expensive in Brazil and obviously very inexpensive in Venezuela with the Chavez government. So he had military pumping gas there in camouflage with machine guns and big rolls of cash. And meanwhile, there are all these like mine, wildcat miners coming out of the Amazon with their gold to sell in the corner and there are prostitutes all over the place and money changers on all the corners. And it's a real wild west town. But I, yeah, I, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of stuff. So not only not only the tax thing, but the other thing about being a writer is that you can kind of look at uh, the, another big upside is that you, you know negative negative or situations that seem negative to other people are often make a good fodder for writing. So thank you very much. Thank you.